We're back with Joe Jorgensen, who is the Libertarian Party presidential candidate in this year's presidential election, and she's here with us to discuss her 2020 campaign for the White House. Joe, good morning. Great to see you. So first of all, remind our viewers what the Libertarian Party stands for and tell us what are the major issues you're running for president on. Well, I say that the Libertarian Party is on your side and not the side of special interests and bureaucrats in Washington, that you know better how to spend your money and you know best what your family needs and not the politicians. And my main issues are health care, bringing the troops home, and the environment. So tell us about your experiences running for president. You were on this show back in July. Tell us about how the campaign and how the process for running for president has been for you from then till now. It's been great. We've been going around the country. We had a tour bus uh, with my name painted a little too big on the side. And we've been, we, I think together, we've been to 47 states, something like that, between me and my running mate. And everywhere we go, we see huge crowds. And I mean, usually I have a couple hundred people. Um, we've had as many as over 400, uh, up to 500 people. And uh, a lot of people aren't in the party. And that's what's so amazing. Some of our earlier stops, the smaller uh, places, when we could kind of talk to people, uh, my deputy campaign manager would go out and ask people, okay, is anybody here not a member of the party? We can sign you up. And we were shocked that about three quarters of each of the groups that we were speaking to were not members of the party. And about 75% of the volunteers on the campaign staff are from outside the party. So it shows that a lot of people realize that the current system is just broken and we need change. Well, Joe, looking at the uh, campaign, there are only three candidates that are on the ballot in all 50 states. That's President Trump, Democratic candidate Joe Biden, and you. But you were invited to the presidential debates. What was that about? <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> but no, I would suggest that they didn't want people to know that there's a real alternative. Because I keep hearing people say, well, you know, two old rich white guys. And I would suggest that that's the least of our problems. That the real problem is they both want to spend our money. They both want to make decisions for us. Neither one has an answer to our crushing health care costs. And uh, neither one is going to bring the troops home. So I would be the only real alternative. So what is your um, message to the debate commission? And what type of, well, first of all, did they ever say anything to you about why you weren't invited to the debates? And what's your message to them for future debates? Well, their official answer is that I didn't reach 15%. However, in order to reach 15% in certain polls, you have to be in the polls. Now, in 2016, when Gary Johnson was our presidential nominee, uh, he was included in the polls early and often, and he got as high as 13.6%. So I looked at those numbers and I thought, well, we can get a boost just above that. So when it came time this time to uh, be in the polls, uh, I think the powers that be decided, you know what, 13.6%, that's dangerously close to 15%. Uh, let's just not put her on the polls. And that's what they did. My name wasn't even in the polls. So it was impossible for me to get on the, on the uh, debate stage. And further, if I'm not in the polls, then my name's not getting out there. Because in 2016, people would see, you know, on TV, the internet, newspapers, you know, here's the polling. Trump, Hillary, and then Gary Johnson. And people would go, oh, wow, there's somebody else running. Let me check them out. But now my name wasn't reported, so we didn't get my name out there. And that's the problem with the Democrats and Republicans is that it's an old boys club. They only want um, themselves to be in the game, and they are not allowing anybody. And that's what power does to people. And that's part of the libertarian message is that uh, – that once people get power, they want more of it, and we've got to take power away from the Democrats and Republicans. 
Let me remind our viewers that they can join in on this conversation. We're going to open up our regular lines. That means that Republicans, you're 202-748-8001. Democrats, you're 202-748-8000. Independents, your line is 202-748-8002. And we're going to open up a special line for Libertarian Party members. Libertarian Party members, we want to hear from you at 202-748-8003. Remember, you can also text us at 202-748-8003 and we're always reading on social media on twitter at c-span wj and on facebook at facebook.com slash c-span so joe you've talked a couple of times about gary johnson's run in 2016. has the libertarian party increased since then about how many members are actually counted as part of the libertarian party right now Oh, I actually haven't kept up with that, but we are increasing, and that was part of my promise when I was uh, when I was campaigning for the nomination is that I would increase membership. I can tell you that you know seventy five percent of the people for, uh, in our campaign are from outside the party, so I know we're increasing the movement. And usually, what happens is people will join after the election, so uh, we'll have a better idea of the numbers uh, in a couple months. But you're, are you are seeing, or while you're going around the nation, more and more people showing up saying that they are Libertarian Party members? Oh, I know people are signing up, absolutely. We were handing out membership forms uh, when I was speaking. And as I mentioned, it, it was surprising to see how many people were from outside the party. So what are you hearing from those voters that the reason why they want to be part of the Libertarian Party. What are you hearing from the people around the United States? What are they telling you? Well, I've heard a lot of people recently, especially when I was in California, uh, telling me that they were recovering Democrats. And I, I, I couldn't believe the number of people who said that. But it, they're, they're not even coming up to me and saying this particular issue or that particular issue is bad. What they're saying is there's just a general lack of a sense of control, that they feel that they don't have control over their lives. They don't understand why they're just not getting ahead in the job market. They don't understand, uh, you know, all the student debt that they have, that somehow they just feel like they're just not getting anywhere. And I can see why, because government has put all of these obstacles in the way. Speaking of student student debt, we just got a, a question from one of our social media followers that who wants you to answer a question about it. Uh, and this, they say student loans are the worst example of big government tyranny in the nation, in my humble opinion. I expect Joe is for getting the government out of student loans, but would she also cancel the debt? What is her solution to the big government student debt crisis? Well, I wouldn't cancel the debt, and I'm sure a lot of your viewers saw that clip of Elizabeth Warren coming off the stage when the father, and my, my heart just broke for him, uh, and by the way, Elizabeth Warren, I'm sure all your viewers know, uh, wanted to just forgive all the debt. And he came up and he said, you know, I worked a second job to get my kid through school. We worked so hard so that we wouldn't have to take out a student loan. Meanwhile, my neighbor took out a student loan and they bought a new car, they went on vacation. So now you're gonna give them money and I don't get money? And she was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and he's like, well, where's my money? I did the right thing, I took a second job. And you know, the answer was just kind of like tough luck. And I think Americans see that as very unfair. Um, why should the guy who uh, worked a second job uh, just be told, well, tough luck, and the guy who took out, I mean, essentially, if they paid off student loans, it, the, the guy, the, his neighbor would basically be given money from the government to buy a new car and go on vacation. And that's obscene. So uh, what I would do, however, is I would make the loans bankruptable so that, you, you know, right now, of course, that's the way government works. They say, hey, if you're a corporation, no problem. Somebody can declare bankruptcy and just not pay you back. Oh, but we're the government, you know, you got to pay us. And they use, I would say, predatory practices. Uh, you've got 18 year olds who, whose brains haven't been fully developed and aren't really going to be fully developed until after they graduate. 
uh, signing up for a very adult uh, thing who are now, you know, left in the dust. And one other quick thing, when people ask me why I'm running for president, I say it's because government is too big, too bossy, too nosy, too intrusive. But the worst part is it hurts the very people they try to help. This is one example. People could make it through college. They could, they could work a job and get through college. And the government comes along and says, oh, well, it's kind of challenging, so let's make it easier. So they flood the market with money, which any economist would correctly predict that, uh, that the prices would go up. And that's exactly what happened. Let's let our viewers join in on this conversation. Let's start with Randy, who's calling from Pell City, Alabama, on the independent line. Randy, good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. Hello? Go ahead, Randy. You're on the air. Yes, I want to ask her. I wasn't talking about decriminalized drugs and stuff. I mean, why would you want to decriminalize something that's killing millions and millions of people? I know y'all going to holler, go put them in treatment. You can't put drug dealers in treatment. I've done lost half of my family on count of drug dealers. And then you have people like this lady here sitting up there talking about it ought not be de it ought to be decriminalized. I mean, stuff like that, it just don't even make sense in this country. People that feel like that, they need to move to another country and leave our country alone. Well, I am so sorry to hear for your loss, and I'm, my heart breaks for you, and this is exactly why I want to decriminalize. And what I've been asking voters is, when's the last time you heard of a liquor store owner going up and down the halls of a high school trying to push gin on high school students? When's the last time you heard of a vodka ha uh, addict breaking into houses in order to support a vodka habit? And when's the last time you heard of two liquor store owners having a shootout over the best corner? Those are not drug problems. Those are drug prohibition problems. And just like we had Al Capone in the 1920s with gunfights and killing innocent people in Chicago in the 1920s, now we've got people being shot by gangs, innocent bystanders in Chicago because of a prohibition problem. And I would suggest that you know, if, if, if you had family members who were killed or who died from certain drugs, first of all, um, it's, it's, prob it's probable that those drugs were pushed on them and perhaps at a young age because that's what's done for the profit motive. Again, you don't see liquor store owners trying to push uh, liquor, push gin or bourbon on 12 year olds or 15 year olds or 18 year olds because the profit's not there because it's legal. Also, the opioid crisis we have, it's absurd because so many people could have had their pain solved with marijuana, which is not as addictive and which is safer than bourbon or gin. And last, I was on a podcast in which uh, the host said, okay, well, I'm with you on the marijuana. We can legalize that, but we're not going to legalize meth because Meth is horrible. I don't want my next door neighbor to have a meth house. You know, people have bought meth houses and there's toxins in there and it's, it's dangerous exposure to the kids. And I told him, I said, that's exactly why meth should be legal. When's the last time you ever heard of somebody making bathtub gin? You know, I would much rather have Seagram's or Philip Morris making uh, the meth than to have it made out of the house next door to me. It would be much safer done that way. So you look at the distribution of alcohol and how it's not pushed one-on-one -on -one directly to kids. And it, you know that's what I would like to see for the other drugs. And also, and again, I'm not sure uh, the exact, exact nature of the deaths and so on, but many people who do use drugs, just uh, they don't know what they're getting. You know, something like marijuana, which, again, is a heck of a lot. You know, the, the, the old joke goes, the only way you're going to die from marijuana is if a bell of it falls on your head. Uh, so if, um, you know, we've got drug dealers out there who are lacing it with toxic substance, uh, substances. We've got people who are using heroin who, if marijuana had been illegal, maybe, or legal, maybe they would have never used it. Now there's fentanyl in it, which is killing them. And last, I'd like to point out that economist Milton Friedman said that if cocaine weren't 
illegal, we would never have crack cocaine because economically it wouldn't make sense that it doesn't make sense to come up with such a strong substance. Just like in alcohol prohibition, beer and wine drinking went down and liquor sales went up because it was easier to smuggle. So now what they're doing is they're making drugs much more concentrated, much more toxic, because that's how they do it in a black market. If it weren't in a black market, drugs would be safer. People could easier get help because they wouldn't have to be worried about being thrown in jail. And again, we don't have drug pushers with the profit trying to get people hooked. Let's talk to Jonelle, who's calling from Fort Washington, Maryland, on the Democratic line. Jonelle, good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hello. Hello. You're on the air. Go ahead. Okay, I'm, you know, voting for the Democratic Party and Joe Biden because I believe that he's the man for the right reason, and he um, is, an, is a candidate for all seasons. And, you know, um, uh, Donald Trump should be uh, prosecuted uh, again and he's immoral, and he should be prosecuted on moral turpitude, you know, going around uh, violating an airline stewardess who was just doing her job, then going to another country and giving people golden showers. This man is terrible. And if that's not bad enough, he didn't have uh, uh, correct etiquette at um uh, when he met uh, Queen Elizabeth. And Go ahead and respond there, Joe. He's talking sure. more about President well, Trump. Well, I would ask your viewer, um, what is it you like most about Joe Biden? The fact that he crafted the crime bill in the 90s, which was extremely racist and put people away for life, for things that, that for crimes which there were no victim? Or do you like the fact that he got us into the Iraqi war, that he was one of the major instigators and he's a war hawk and he's gonna have our young kids around the world killed in senseless wars, which don't help us at all, which actually make us less safe like we saw on 9-11. Or do you like the fact that he thinks he, he, he knows better about how to run each of our lives? You know, I, I just really was upset when I saw the town hall in which he said, you know, for police, what I want is I want social workers and psychologists. And oh, by the way, I think that we need more of this kind of training or that kind of training. Now, he may or may not be right. But here's the thing. What is the president doing with our local communities? I mean, crime is a local issue, whether it's assault, robbery, burglary, whatever. And, uh, and I would say it's up to each of our towns. My town has different needs than where I'm going today, Columbus, Ohio, which has different needs than Salt Lake City. And shouldn't my police department be able to have its own uh, rules? Shouldn't my mayor, city council, voters, residents, shouldn't we have our own choice? Or is it the fact that you like that he really likes the Department of Education, which is bankrupting kids, which is basically predatory loans? I mean, I'm not sure what laws Joe Biden has passed or what he's advocated that's done any good. Or the fact that he was for Obamacare, which increased, not decreased. You know, is that why you think a vote for Joe Biden is a good idea? Because you want health care costs to go up even more? because they didn't go up enough when he was vice president. And let me ask one, or let me make one more comment. I grew up in the 60s, and I think about the Democratic Party that I grew up with. It was anti-war. It was pro-individual. It was for free speech. And now the Democratic Party is nothing like that. They shut down Tulsi Gabbard, the only anti-war voice out there, and, you know, since uh, Barack or since uh, Joe Biden is on the coattails of Barack Obama, I'd like to point out that both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton 
thought that gay marriage should be illegal as recently as 2012. I mean, is that really the Democratic Party that people want to want to belong to? And is was Joe Biden your first choice? And what I've been telling Democrats, hey, if Joe Biden was your first choice and you think he's great, you love his crime bill, which put away people of color at a higher rate than whites, go ahead and vote for Joe Biden. But if you feel like the Democratic Party leadership shoved Joe Biden down your throat, how about voting for me and sending a message to the Democratic Party? You know what? Um, we don't like you shoving candidates down our throat. If you let us pick our own candidates, then we'll vote for the Democrat. But we're not going to be led by a party machine. Well, that was one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about, Joe. Uh, what is causing voters who supported President Trump in 2016 or Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton in 2016 to support the Libertarian Party in this cycle? Can you tell us what's bringing voters over to your side now? Oh, yeah. With Trump voters, it's uh, his, his record. And what I've been telling people is I completely understand why you voted for Trump in 2016. He came in as an outsider. I'm going to fix the system. I'm a businessman. I know how to balance a budget. I know how to, how to cut spending. I'm going to cut the deficit. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to bring the troops home, too. I mean, that sounds like a great message. And it's from somebody who didn't have 50 years of political favors to pay back. It was somebody who didn't have to repay back somebody who, um, you know, put him in state house or whatever. And yet he's increased the deficit at, at a faster rate than Obama. And by the way, yes, that was before uh, the coronavirus. We've got the biggest debt ever. And he didn't bring the troops home. So what I've been telling Trump voters is, you know what, if, um, if, if you like the fact, you know, if, if the reason you voted for Trump was to get bigger government under Obama, if the reason you voted for Trump is you don't think Obama increased the deficit fast enough, then go ahead and vote for Trump. But if you want to send a mes message to Trump, which is, hey, we voted for you because you're an outsider, uh, since you're not being the outsider, we're going to vote for the real outsider. And I've been especially telling people in the red states, hey, Donald Trump's going to get all your electoral college votes anyway. Um, your vote isn't going to matter. So how about at least sending a message to Trump so that if he wins again, that he gets the message that, oh, I guess, <laughs> I guess my voters want me to act like the outsider I said I would be. Let's go back to our phone lines and talk to Jeff, who's calling from Good Virginia. And Jeff's calling on the Libertarian line. Jeff, good morning. Good morning, and uh, I would like to talk, thank Ms. Jorgensen for being our candidate for president. And uh, the Libertarian idea is personal responsibility. And uh, I, that is missing in today's world is that personal responsibility. The government isn't our nanny. Uh, and I would like to bring this to light. I feel like I'm the lone libertarian on C-SPAN. I belong to several of your uh, companion sites, I'm going to say. And I get accused of everything, and voting libertarian is not a wasted vote. And uh, Ms. Jorison's word, you know, uh, we have put out several billboards, and I made donations to the party. And even so, last night... Uh, we use the libertarian platform to raise money for the SPCA because it isn't up to the government to take care of us. It's up to personal responsibility. And I would like to have her emphasize that point in her message all the time. Go ahead. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I didn't hear much of a question, but... Uh, let me tell you, you say you feel like the lone libertarian, you know, at least in this world right here. Well, I can tell you, going around the country, there are a lot of people joining our movement. So thank you very much for your support, and uh, thank you for your appreciation for my candidacy. I got to tell you, I've loved almost every minute of it, and it has just been great. It's, it's been so rewarding talking to voters, saying, you know, the old system is broken. We need something new. We have a question from one of our social media followers, and it says, I'm going to follow up this question. I'll ask this question, and I'll give you the follow-up. What is? What are the guest's views on mandating masks, the shutdowns? So my follow-up would be, what would you do as president 
about the coronavirus pandemic sweeping through the country? Well, yeah, that's two parts. Let me ask, answer the mask question first. Libertarians, um, the, the libertarian way is that instead of a one size fits all, that we each get to vote with our feet or vote with our dollars. And this is a great question to just explain the difference between our party and the other two parties. So the way the other parties work, um, and, and now we're having an election coming up. So let's say that your candidate, let, let, let's say that you want to wear a mask and let's say your neighbor doesn't. What you have to do is you have to battle it out. So uh, you pick your candidate who's, who says, yes, I'm going to require everybody to wear a mask, such as Joe Biden is uh, you know, saying that he might do. Whereas let's say your neighbor doesn't want to wear a mask and so he's going to support Trump who's saying, nope, I don't want to wear a mask. So you each have to pick your own candidate, donate money, get all your friends to vote, put out yard signs, and then on election day, both of you vote, and one of you is going to win, and one of you is going to lose, and it's going to be one size fits all. Under the libertarian message, however, you get to make your own decisions. And so if you want to vote to wear a mask that day, then you, go, you can go to Walmart or one of the many other stores that require a mask, regardless of the law. And if that day you don't want to wear a mask, then you can go to a store uh, that doesn't require a mask. And if you always want to wear a mask, you can go to Walmart, the other stores, your neighbor can go to the stores that don't require a mask. And that's the best way to get along with each other. That's the best way to get along with your neighbor. And people ask me why the country is so polarized. I would say it's because we all have to vote on everything for a one size fits all. I mean, what if we all had to vote? Well, are we all going to be vegetarian or are we all going to eat steak? Um, and that might sound like a ridiculous question, but think of how personal it is that we all have to vote on if we're vaccinated or not, or we all have to vote on the same retirement plan, or we all have to vote on the same education. I mean, those are individual choices that we should each make on our own. And so we shouldn't have to battle it out with our neighbor to decide what kind of retirement we want or what kind of health care or education we want for our students. And as long as so many decisions are going through the government, we are going to be at opposite ends. We are going to be in fights with our neighbor because we've got to fight our neighbor just to be able to live our lives how we want. But the Libertarian Party says you vote with your feet, vote with your dollars. You get to make your own choice. So, but if elected president, what would you do right now to uh, stop the coronavirus pandemic? Because we're seeing more and more people getting infected with coronavirus every day. In fact, a record was set on Friday with the number of infections. So what would be your plan if you're president? Yes, to get testing kits out there. And I think that's one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest mistakes that Trump made was early on, uh, he didn't get rid of the obstacles in the FDA and the CDC that prevented people from getting tested. Because if you got testing, then you would know who could continue going out to their jobs and who needed to stay home. South Korea got uh, diagnosed their first case within about a day of our first case. And unlike us, they quickly jumped ahead in testing and got ahead of the virus and they quickly contained it without a lockdown. Meanwhile, we're not being tested. And by the way, why is that? Because of the FDA and the CDC. There were literally dozens of testing kits out there that could have been sold in our country so that we would know if we were uh, positive or not. And thanks to the, the regulations, only two of them were made available. And so, and, and Trump stood on stage with Dr. Fauci saying, well, if you don't have symptoms and don't get tested, even though they knew at the time, the doctors knew that at least half the people who had the virus had no symptoms at all. You know, that's when you should get tested. There are still um, test kits that can't be sold here. There are still obstacles. And uh, I, I don't know what the latest number is, but recently there were still places in which you had to have a doctor's note to get tested. I mean, we should have testing kits being sold in the drugstore so we can have massive testing and people can find out if they're positive or not so that we can start containing this. And um, 
once again, uh, you know, uh, again, I'm running for office because government usually hurts the very people it tries to help. The FDA is supposed to make us more safe, not less safe. And it made us less safe by keeping us from being tested. And still, there are regulations that are keeping us from being tested because now we got to go to the doctor. And we talk about healthcare costs. Wouldn't it be great if we could just buy the test and not go through an expensive doctor? Let's go back to our phone lines and let's talk to Sylvia, who's calling from Etland, Virginia, on the Republican line. Sylvia, good morning. Uh, yes, I was going to ask Joe, uh, what would she do about the SOL testing in the school set aside the pandemic? Um, I've seen children and teachers just about wringing their hands because during the time they have to be tested, uh, the standard of learning tests, and they mean so much for their uh, funds at the school. What would you do about um, getting rid of them, which I think they should be? Thank you. That education is a local issue. It should be decided among parents, teachers, and students that the needs of the children in rural Appalachia are much different than the needs of kids in downtown New York City, much different than the needs of kids in uh, New Mexico. So I would get the federal government out of education. And I would, you know, right now we've got money that schools, that, that taxpayers are paying that go to the federal government. And then again, we've got a one size fits all from the government. I would end that so that localities got to keep their money and then let them make decisions. Uh, the average person should have very little contact with the federal government. The federal government should be uh, in charge of the military, federal courts, and everything else. Really, we should be making our decisions locally where our voices can have an impact. And you know, once again, we, we heard this about Common Core, we're hearing this about other things. Why do we have to have all, you know, 300 something million people all agree on one thing? Why can't we make our own decisions on what's best for our children? Here's a question from another one of our social media followers. They want to know, what is your plan for the national debt? What is your plan for social security? Wow, two big questions. So the national debt, uh, the, the quick answer to, to, speak, to begin with is if you're digging yourself into a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging, which unfortunately Donald Trump didn't do. He continued to dig. So the first thing we do is stop digging and stop getting into that. Then we need to start paying it off. So what I would do is I would look at places to cut. And let me start off because I, I don't want to just jump to this one statement, but let me start off by saying I want to turn America into one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral. We absolutely have to protect our shores. However, we don't need to be in the 150 countries we're in around the world. We don't need to spend more than the next seven countries combined, which is what we spend now. We could cut six to seven hundred um, billion dollars from the budget and still be tied for the largest military budget on the face of this earth. And I think that's a good start. And, you know, we keep hearing how great France is that they get five week vacations. Well, I've been saying, you know what, uh, maybe if we weren't paying for their military and every other military around the world, maybe we could have five-week vacations too. I mean, why should taxpayers in Alabama be paying for France's military? And if it were just a question of uh, money, that'd be bad enough. But it's even worse because it's making us less safe, not more safe, as we saw with 9-11. We need to bring our troops home and defend our country. So that would be a big cut to start paying back. And also I would get rid of, for instance, the Department of Education. Education should be local. Maybe if the dollars stayed in the local communities instead of um, going to the government with the government then turning around and spending money that's not doing any good at all, uh, maybe teachers wouldn't have to be buying their own boxes of Kleenex and crayons. And last, uh, number three on there would be to end foreign aid. 
from the government. Now, Americans are very generous, and if they want to help people overseas, you know, they're free to do so. But the U.S. government shouldn't be the one sending money over. When the government does it, it's very inefficient. And there's a joke that foreign aid, the definition of foreign aid, is taking money from poor taxpayers and giving it to rich dictators. And we've seen that happen, where the money doesn't go to where it belongs. Uh, personally, you know, you know, we saw George Clooney over um, in the in Sudan talking about uh, all the. Um, I'm sorry, but, well. Yeah, maybe the, the reference is uh, uh, too long ago. But anyway, we saw George Clooney over there trying to help people in Africa. Heck, I would trust George Clooney to spend my money better than the federal government. So we need to start cutting at all levels so that we can get down to size. And you know, the question about what you would do with Social Security? Yes. So that's not, you know, we know it's a broken system. Uh, look at you know two groups of people. For people who are retired, I say that you know every year they're dependent on the whims of Congress. Uh, did, are they getting their cost of living increase? And they had that money, Social Security money, taken out of their paycheck before they even got their paycheck. And unlike the lockbox that we heard Al Gore talk about, we didn't get you know their money didn't go into a lockbox. It went for general. Uh, general uh, running of the government, things that they shouldn't have been spending money on anyway. So what I would do is I would sell those things where the money went, which would be like downtown fancy office buildings or oil rights, mineral rights, whatever, sell those things, give the seniors a lump sum so that now they're in control of their retirement dollars. And to everybody else, I say you can have an immediate opt out People in their 20s, people in their 30s, they know they're never going to see a dime of their Social Security money. So I would give them an immediate opt out so they can look for something that's safe. And again, why do we all need to vote on one retirement system? Let's uh, go to Daniel, who's calling from San Antonio, Texas, on the independent line. Daniel, good morning. Hello, good morning. I wanted to know how do the limited government values of the Libertarian Party coexist with the modern Keynesian approach? And what role would you take as the government in recession? Again, I'm not even, I'm, I'm not out here talking about which system is better? That's what dictators do. That's what that's what we see right now with um, our current leadership. Is do we have this model or this model or this model? And I would suggest that people elected to office can't do anything as well as people making their own decisions. And something I learned in I don't know fifth grade that really stuck with me that I wish uh, schools would teach now is that the reason the Soviet Union fell is that central planning doesn't work. That over in the Soviet Union, they had to figure out where does the steel go? Should we send the steel to the car manufacturers or should we send it to the refrigerator manufacturers? And you would have people sitting there in the capital trying to figure out where does it need to go? In the United States, however, we had the price system tell us where it needs to go. So if there were people, uh, if, if the car manufacturers had a waiting list of people waiting to buy cars, then the car manufacturers were willing to pay more for the steel. And so that's where it went. If instead, uh, no waiting line for the cars, but people needing refrigerators had a waiting line, then the people making refrigerators would pay more for the steel. And that's where it would go. So using prices as a guide, uh, then we know that the resources go where they need to go instead of people running the office. So what I would do, you know, I, I believe that government's role is police, courts, and military. 
And when it comes to everything else, it should be people making their own decisions. And that's what I've been telling voters, that you know better than any bureaucrat and lobbyist and special interest in Washington how to spend your money and how to make your decisions. So I'm just out here telling people that they need to, that they have the right to make their own decisions and that we don't need to have people in Washington coming up with any kind of system to manage the government. Uh, first of all, I don't trust Trump, uh, Trump or Biden to make better decisions in where the money's going to go or who's going to be hired. And we certainly saw with the Soviet Union. It doesn't work. Joe, earlier in the show, we talked about ranked choice voting. Um, oh. And we know that Maine is going to do ranked choice voting in this upcoming election. One of our social media followers wants to know, are you in favor of ranked choice voting? And if so, what would your ballot look like ranking yourself, Trump, Biden, and Green Party candidate, uh, Howie Hawkins? I am a huge fan of ranked choice voting. And I think that the Americans deserve that because right now when you ask people uh, who you're voting for, it's, it's usually a vote out of fear. It's usually a vote against the other guy. And that's such a shame that as Americans, we have to pick our president out of fear. And that's what I keep hearing from people. Oh, I'm a fan of yours. I'm going to vote for you. But my friend wouldn't vote for you because she's afraid of, you know, Trump getting into office or he's afraid that Biden's going to get into office. And uh, so absolutely, we should have ranked choice voting so that people can vote for what they want instead of against what they want. Now, as far as what I would do, you know, right now, uh, where I live in South Carolina, we have straight ticket uh, voting. And usually only maybe a third of the offices have a libertarian running anyway. I, I still vote straight ticket libertarian. So in other words, you know, if there's, let's say, you know, 12 races, my vote's only being cast for three or four because it doesn't matter to me if the Democrat or Republican wins because it's a completely different mindset. Both the Democrats and Republicans feel that they should be the one making our decisions, that they should be the ones spending our money. And both of them, you know, like I said, we've got Donald Trump giving us a bigger deficit than, than Barack Obama. Apparently, it doesn't really matter who's in office when you've got people who think that they should be running the country instead of allowing people to make decisions and allowing people to be running their own lives. Speaking of that straight ballot, straight ticket ballot, uh, you're not the only libertarian running in this November's election. There are other libertarians down ballot across the country. How are there races out there that libertarians are not only competitive, but they are expected to win down ballot? And how many state and, and local offices are held by the Libertarian Party right now? Well, as far as how many are in office, that's probably a better chair, a uh, better question for our national chair who keeps tabs with that. We've just been focused on our campaign. However, I can tell you that uh, we do have, um, well, well, of course, our highest ranking libertarian is Justin Amash, who is a libertarian congressman. And we do have several uh, important uh, seats locally. Uh, the two races that I've been hearing the most about and that I've gone to would be Harrington in Arkansas, who's running against Cotton, and it's a two way race, and then Rainwater in uh, Indiana running against both the Democrat and Republican. But the people there, again, are getting fed up with the one size fits all system, especially the masks. And he's the one saying that you should be able to make your own choice. And if you want to be safe, then you can make the choice to only go to those places that require a mask. But if you prefer not to wear a mask, you're an American. This is a free country. You should have that option. Let's go back to our phone lines and let's talk to Janet, who's calling from Winter Park, Florida, on the Democratic line. Janet, good morning. Hi, Joe. Uh, Hi. I was born and raised a Democrat, um, but in 1989, I joined the Libertarian Party 
uh, because I believed in the individual liberty and personal responsibility. You know, I even ran for office three times. Once I couldn't get on the ballot because of ballot access, but the other two times I was able to run. And this was in the 90s. And libertarians down here were running against Republicans. In my race, I got 28 percent of the vote and over 10,000 votes against a Republican. That was in the 90s. Unfortunately, what happened was the Republican Party cannibalized the Libertarian Party in the 90s. We were getting too successful, and our party officers, some of them went and joined the the uh, Republicans, the uh, uh, they even told me if I joined the Republicans, they could get me elected. Well, those Repu- those libertarians who joined the Republicans disappeared, and you never heard from them again. Unfortunately, so many libertarians joined with the Republicans that it completely changed the libertarians. They made an alliance with the Republicans and Christian coalition, and uh, throughout 2000, they were just like Republican light, and that's what they've continued to be here in uh, Central Florida. I, in 2008, I went back to being a Democrat, and I voted for Barack Obama and uh, have voted Democrat ever since because I saw that the policy, policies pushed by libertarians uh, and Republicans caused us so much social and economic problems uh, under George Bush that I washed my hands of, of both Republicans and libertarians completely. Go ahead and respond, Joe. Yeah, well, okay. Um, Absolutely, I would never vote for Bush. And most people who are truly libertarians would never vote for Bush. And if you're for personal responsibility and individual liberty, I'm not sure how Barack Obama uh, gives that to you. Basically, Barack Obama came in and said, you don't have to be responsible at all. And by the way, I'm not going to give you the freedom to buy your own health care. I'm not going to give you the freedom. I mean, in 2012, he thought gay marriage should be illegal. Do you really did? Did you really think that gay marriage should be illegal in 2012? Uh, again, I would suggest that there's far greater similarities between the Democrats and Republicans, both in how they spend money and in in what they believe in personal freedom. Only recently has Joe Biden grudgingly come along and said, okay, well, maybe we can legalize marijuana, but, you know, I don't want to talk about it too much. So I'm not sure how that gives you any individual liberty or freedom at all. Let's go back to the phone and talk to Felicia, who's calling from Birmingham, Alabama, on the Libertarian line. Felicia, good morning. Yes. If you become president, what would you do for the stimulus check? Because I am borrowing someone else's cell phone right now using it. Can't even afford to pay for my phone. Also, also to me, uh, you really lied on Joe Biden, and you are campaigning for Trump. Because I don't even think you're campaigning for yourself. Well, I, I'm a little confused by the last statement because I think I've said three times on the show so far that Trump has increased the deficit even more than Barack Obama. So I've been talking really um, – I thought I was being equal in showing uh, the problems. Uh, and, and as I said before, both Democrats and Republicans want to spend our money, want to make decisions for us. They've got a one-size-fits-all. We vote. We put somebody in office for two years, four years, six years. You know, should we all be vegetarians or should we all eat steak? They both want that system. Libertarians are the ones who want people to make their own decisions. But as far as the stimulus check, and and I'm so sorry that you're in the, the position that you're in. And I would suggest that you're in that position because of Donald Trump's policies, because he said don't get tested because he wouldn't allow testing kids into this country, because he didn't get rid of the FDA obstacles. Now, let me mention, I don't think Joe Biden would have been any better. They both would have said, nope, nope, you know, we need to have the FDA 
you know, it, uh, we, we need to, you know, let the FDA have their powers. And that's a, a different discussion. But under my system, we could get back to our jobs. We wouldn't be all under house arrest. And by the way, I would use the 14th Amendment to, to start suing states and say that you can't keep people locked up, that they need to earn a living, and that the shutdown is causing more problems than it's helping. And by the way, if you allow people to keep their money and you keep and you let that money stay in the hands of individuals and private businesses, you will see twice as many jobs as if that same money went to the government. And last, I'd like to point out that it was the government who said, oh, of course, big corporations and big box chain stores, you can stay open, of course, because they get campaign contributions. But mom and pop stores, the little stores, you got to shut down. So once again, we've got big corporations and big companies being treated um, specially by people in Congress. And that's what we got to get rid of. We got to get power to the little guy. We got to get these politicians out of office so that little stores, so mom and pop stores can stay open so that we can all retain our jobs. Let's go to Dexter, who's calling from Newport, Kentucky, on the Republican line. Dexter, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, Dexter. Uh, yes. Uh, well, it seems like the news stations are never going to let another party go to. So they're too invested in their own candidate. So if you take votes away from their candidate, then they're 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 so invested in that candidate, you're never going to get any traction. And really, there's so much money. Uh, Joe Biden totally corrupt. The stations won't even go investigate this corruption, and, and probably it's it's all through the Congress. They probably they probably don't want to push this because they're doing the same thing. So we're never going to really. You know, get out of this mode, get another party, because everybody's invested in their own candidates. Now, how are you going to get on any news cycle? Yeah, that's a great question. And, of course, we all know that the media consists of, what, 92, 96 percent Democrats, uh, depending on which uh, – which, uh, poll you look at. So we're trying to get our message out through social media, and we are getting somewhere. And keep in mind, uh, you don't have to be elected to make change, although, of course, I am running to be elected. Uh, I, I, I hate using this trite example. I'm sure you've heard it a million times, but the early 1900s uh, socialist platform, by the end of the century, all of those um, planks. Every single plank had been adopted into the uh, country's uh, system, even though a single socialist hadn't been elected as president or um, to Congress. So we can make change. We have been the so-called spoiler in major elections. And so when we come in there, people are talking about, uh, you know, people, we change the conversation. And in fact, um, looking at the Democrats and Republicans, we have, you know, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but it, it looks like they have been watching our campaign. And we've seen evidence of that from other things, not just what's being said in the media. But, you know, notice Donald Trump is talking about bringing the troops home. So, and I would like to point out for those people who suggest, oh, you're going to be a spoiler and keep Donald Trump from being elected. If he had cut the deficit and cut the debt, like he said, if he had been the businessman he said he was and could balance the budget, he would win by a landslide. But again, um, they're not doing what they say they'll do. So, and that's why I said earlier, if you're in a red state, uh, vote for me to send uh, Trump a message. If you're in a blue state, vote for Biden to send a message. I would suggest if you're in a swing state, you have the most power that if you cause one or the other candidate to not be elected, they will start listening to you. And that's what we need to do is we need to tell Republicans, hey, start acting like Republicans. And we need to tell Democrats, 
hey, start acting like Democrats, because neither one of them are acting what their what their roots are. Now we've just got the red team and the blue team, and it's whatever the guy, whatever the other guy says, we're the opposite. And and by the way, let me quickly add. For instance, when Trump said, "Oh, we need to pull out of Iraq," here's the Democratic Party, which is supposed to be anti-war. They're saying, "Oh, no, no, we can't get out of Iraq. We need to stay there." I mean, basically, they're just going to do whatever Trump doesn't want to do. So instead of having the red team and the blue team, the Democratic Party needs to go back to being anti-war. The Republican Party needs to go back to trying to cut the spending. All right, Joe, final words before we have to end the show for any potential voters out there? Sure. Well, first of all, you can go to my website, which is joe20.com. That's JO20.com if you'd like to check us out. And I've been telling people, you know, I'm not asking you to cast a vote for me because you're voting for me. I'm asking you to cast a vote for you. And that's what I'm saying. Vote for yourself. A vote for me is a vote for yourself because I know that you can make decisions better than any special interest in Washington. You know what your family needs more than any bureaucrat in Washington. And I think that you know best what's best for you. So vote for yourself. We'd like to thank Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian Party presidential candidate, for being on with us this morning. Joe, thank you so much for your time. Oh, great to be here. Thanks again. And we'd like to thank all of our guests our viewers, our callers, and our social media followers for another great show. Remember, have a great Saturday and continue to wash your hands. We'll see you next, next time on Washington Journal. <laughs>